Hey, how you doing? Uh, welcome uh, back again. We're still doing our series on First Fruits one-on-one uh, -on -one that we normally do on our Wednesdays. My name is Pastor Yaku Shelley. I'm the senior pastor of the Hand of the Lord International. I want to thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you for your continued support. Uh, last week we talked about uh, the truth behind Easter. I want to encourage you to go in and check that out. If you haven't heard it yet, you can find it on our website, www.thehand.us. And then we allowed that to flow into uh, the seven places that Jesus shed his blood purpose of that teaching was to uh, explain the sacrifice that Christ made. I want to encourage you to do that. I want to encourage you to write those uh, seven places down, incorporate those inside of your uh, prayer. And what you're going to find, I'm believing God that your faith in him will increase. You're going to find that there were seven places that Jesus shed his blood and it covers all seven aspects of your life. I, I promise you it's going to be life changing. I want to encourage you, if you haven't seen it, uh, to go and look at it. And if you have already seen it, tag someone and definitely share it with them. So we're going to continue on our uh, First Fruits one-on-one -on -one, uh, series, teaches through answering questions and asking questions. So uh, if you would, as we're going through this series, you should find a place on our website where you can comment uh, or ask questions, and we promise you we will get back to you in a timely manner. Uh, as we talked about first fruits, we understand that first fruits always deal with increase. Um, obviously, it can be connected to your giving. It can be connected to tangible things. It can be connected to having a new job. It can be connected to getting married. It can be connected to having children. In other words, first fruit also, what separates first fruit from tithe, I would, tithing, um, I would say that first fruits can be connected to people. So we've talked about that how when you go to another level in your life, that is certain things that God requires out of you. Uh, as we are dealing with the coronavirus and now people's finances are being um, um, affected, uh, one of the things that get, uh, was on my heart two weeks ago and I said I, I would go into is the story of uh, Joseph. And so we want to look at Genesis chapter 37. Uh, we want to begin at verse 1. And as you're following along with me, certain points I want to pull out. Uh, so when we look at Genesis 37, uh, chapter, chapter 37, verse 1, it says, And Jacob dwelt in a land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. And it says, And these are the generations of Jacob. Joseph being 17 years old, so I want you to uh, keep that in mind, that Joseph was 17 at the time, was feeding the flock with his brethren and the lad who uh, the lad was, I'm sorry, with the sons of Bala and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. And it says that and now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. And he had and he made him a coat of many colors. Now, what I want to point out, first I want to point out that the Bible is specific to tell us that Joseph was 17 years old. If you're doing a, um, if you're taking notes, go ahead and write down that, that 17 means spiritual order, or it, it points us to the fact of walking with God. Now, he has, he has older brothers. He has 10 older brothers that's older than him. He has one younger brother at this time by the name of Benjamin. Benjamin, you study this, Benjamin is around six, seven, eight years old, uh, depending upon where you look and where you study from. But his older brother, Reuben, is 29 at the time. So Reuben is 29. That means he has uh, 10 other brothers that is between the ages of 20, uh, 29, 28, and 18 years old. Here Joseph comes. He is the 11th child of uh, Jacob, who is going to be called Israel too. The 12th child is Benjamin. And it says that while they were out and they were serving or tending the flock, that Joseph would take the initiative, according to verse 3, and he would go back to his father and give an evil report. In other words, tell on them. So when we look at the fact that Joseph was probably considered by his other brothers a telltale, uh, you can also look at this from this perspective. What if uh, Joseph was being groomed as a manager? So now he's being given a different uh, place of accountability than the other brothers, and maybe they, they recognize that his father is, is favoring him. Maybe he's not asked to do as much work as the other brothers. We see that he's outside tending the flock, but we also see that he's talking to his father in a different perspective as it relates to a report back to say what the other brothers are doing. I want to go from a perspective of management because we're going to see later on that Joseph 
gets managerial positions everywhere he go. We're going to see that he's going to end up in Potiphar's house, ends up being a manager. He's going to go to the prison, ends up being a manager. He's going to now stand before Pharaoh. He's going to be the CFO over Egypt. He's also a manager. And so what I want to point out to you is that now we see that Joseph is in some kind of managerial position. I would challenge someone with that, and I would stick with that because we see it being progressive later on. But he's having to first fruit this responsibility he's imagine being the the youngest of of at that moment out of 10 you got 10 older brothers but when you come along your father now begins to groom you in management we see that Reuben has some form of management they listen to him when we see at the end of Genesis when when jo, uh, Jacob is about to die Israel is about to die he tells Reuben that you're my firstborn here's how I looked at you here's what I was looking for you but you failed me and so he goes back with an e-report, and I don't want to look at him as being a telltale, though that is what I heard people minister on. What if he's simply telling his father the truth? What if he's telling them, well, Dad, while we out there, they spend four hours working, they spend the other four hours lollygagging, chasing the women, you know, not doing what they're supposed to do. And I don't believe he's lying to, to his father. I believe he's giving an honest report as what's going on, but the report is evil. In other words, it's telling the truth as to what the brothers are doing. So imagine the other ten brothers, before he start working with them they was able to give get away with stuff that joseph is saying hey no dad is entrusting us with his stuff y'all got to do right and they know that J joseph's gonna tell and so many of you don't understand that when you are moving into the things that god has ordained and he's developing you you must first realize he's going to develop you in stages okay but how you handle stage one is going to dictate your level of progression in stage two three and so on all right now Let's look at this first challenge. One of your first challenges in promotion would be, do you choose to cater to those that's on your level at the expense of doing what you were assigned to do or what you were hired to do? And so what you got to be careful of, and many of you may be in this situation, that when God get ready to promote you, he promotes from within. When he promotes from within, that means he's promoting you when you are around other people that what probably was at another level than you or think that they should be considered at another level. We talked about in, an, in another teaching dealing with first fruit that when increase is given without accountability, it, it breeds entitlement. So imagine the other brothers that haven't been given quite the responsibility, but simply because of their rank and file and being born, feel certain in, uh, a certain entitlement. God, that, that God should allow this to happen. Do you know what my life has been like? These things should manifest myself. Dad should treat me this way. Mom should treat me this way. So the first thing we see is sibling rivalry. You got to understand, let's look at sibling rivalry from this perspective. What if, what if not just a brother or sister, but what if people who have, we got, came in at the same time, we uh, was given the same opportunities, I took what I had, I did more with it, you just chose to do the standard quo, and here's the thing that you got to understand, when promotion time is coming, People, everybody want promotion, but everybody don't want their past brought up. In other words, they don't want you to bring up have they, have they been faithful over a few things that now God wants to make me rule over many. They just look at the fact that why are you doing it with them? Let's look at the sibling rivalry, at, at rivalry as it relates to brothers and sisters. I believe, I personally believe this. I believe that God will allow relationships early on in life because of what we are called to do later on. I believe that every sister, every brother, that they are called to do something together. The problem comes is that when we, we were three and four, we was outside making mud pies. One day we were going to own our own company. But we didn't know at three and four, okay? And so while we we're doing, while we we're making mud pies at three and four, we we're building relationship. We we're seeing, can we trust each other? Can you go and get the water while I provide the, the dirt? Can you go and get the shape of the stars with your easy bake oven system? And I go and get what I have. We we're working together to build a rapport. Somewhere or another, the enemy comes in, and instead of two people working together, the enemy makes them think that they must pit against each other. Here's, here's, here's my point with that. We see, according to verse 3, that Joseph, 
was given some kind of special treatment. It says that his daddy felt somewhere uh, about him and that he was the, the child of his youth. He was child of his uh, older age. If I, when I studied this, I, I recognized that Joseph was, was born and his dad, uh, Jacob, was around 91 years old. At this time in the story, he's about 107. And so it says that verse four says it. But and when his brethren saw that his father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. Part of the things that help you see that 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 promotion is coming. Coming. Watch this. You're going to have a mixture between what you don't like and what you what you what you love. So in other words, watch this. Hate is coming from the brothers, his brothers, but love is coming from his father. So there's a mixture of the two that's going on at the same time. The sad part with what I'm sharing is that as I'm explaining this to someone and helping them to see that God is always intended to promote you. Why? Because there's hate and love being mixed in your life. You really can't comprehend that because you're focusing more on the hate than you are the love. So, Pastor Shelley, well, what happens if I feel like my mother, my father, someone around me, the people on the job, they love somebody else more than me? Here's the thing that I want you to focus on. What about your God? What about the God that you were with before they gave you over to your family members? If, but the God that was in your life that made you for a particular purpose before your father became your father, your mother became your mother. So let's remove this, this chip on your shoulder that you always feel like I was the black sheet of the, of the family. They, they favored this one more than me. They told me I was ugly, but told this one they were pretty. And they told this one that they, ha they had good hair, but told me I had bad hair. Told me I was overweight, but told this other uh, sibling they had a great body. Told this sibling they was good in sports. Told me that I wasn't. Let's, let's remove that out the, out the, uh, uh, from the gate because here's the point that I want to help you to understand. I believe sometimes we're rejected from people so that God can push us closer to him. I want to say that again. Sometimes we're rejected of people so God can push us closer to him. In part of the series that I just shared with the seven places that Jesus shed his blood, uh, as I'm talking about the second place, I'm, I'm, I want to leave that open so you can go back and look at it. I'm going to I use Isaiah 53 as a, a drop point, uh, as, a, as a foundation in Scripture. And here's what the Scripture says. It says that, that Jesus was rejected of men. I recognize that rejection is a huge tool that the enemy used to keep people from walking in the things that God has ordained for them. That so, everybody in some form or fashion in their life can say that they've been rejected. Matter of fact, you would be surprised the things that people do just not to feel rejected. We was talking earlier about uh, makeup and, and, and people fixing themselves up. It's amazing that at one point what people wear every day now was only used for weddings. They was used for uh, proms and special events. Now people go out the door that way. Going out the door that way to, if, and here's the scary part, so afraid of the person that you run into rejecting you that you will fix yourself up and look totally different than how you really look to get someone to approve of you. The sad part is what happens when you go through all of that and you still don't get the approval. It just reinforces the rejection. And so the thing that, that, has to, that has to be dealt with is you have to deal with the spirit of rejection if you're going to be that first fruit offering that God wants you to become. Here's my biggest thing that I would say to deal with that rejection. The first place starts with finding out what has the God who made you said about you. Many times we go to someone else who is also struggling with rejection and then believe that they should confirm to us or reaffirm who we are. But the problem is, but what if they're struggling with their own struggle to such a degree that they don't have time to look at what you're going through and try to develop you? And so if you're looking from, for that, re, uh, that person to give you validation and they got their own thing going on, there's a strong possibility they may not give it to you. So what happens when your father doesn't give it, your mother doesn't give it? And so now does that mean you're worthless? Absolutely not. Here's the thing. You must spend time in the presence of the Lord. You must go back to him and find out, well, God, how did you made me this way? Somebody else may say that my ears are too big, but you knew what you was doing when you gave me these jeans. So are my ears really too big or they, is it just something that they don't prefer? I would rather hold on to, you just don't prefer the size of my ears. It doesn't mean it's something wrong with them. You just, doesn't, you just don't prefer the size of them. If it was up to you, 
you would like them to be smaller. But since they are not, I'm not going to go and get uh, surgery to make them smaller to fit your preference. I'm going to say, you know what? I believe God did not make a mistake when he gave my ears. And I'm using that as an example. And that's something I wrestled with coming up uh, as being, you know, a, a little kid. I was skinny. Uh, and the way that I found that I was skinny, somebody told me that. They said it in a way that made me think that being skinny is a problem. Now, people don't want to eat. They want to be what? They want to be skinny. So is it amazing that the very thing that somebody said was an issue, now somebody else is trying to become? It, 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 you, see how this, you see where I'm going with this? So in other words, you have to be resolved on the inside of you because if you're always looking from people on the outside to validate you and to watch this, fix your insecurity or rejection of men, you'll never walk into what God has ordained because part of the ingredients to get you to the place that God wants you to get to is the fact that man, somebody is going to reject you. If everybody in your life applaud you, when will you ever seek God? When will you ever go back to him? When will you ever ask him, what is it you want me to do? And, and, and my, my heart is aching so much, and I want to deal with those that not recognize we're dealing with a greater audience. I want to deal with those that are in ministry, and you are so afraid at failing because your idea of failing is the size of your church, how many people are going to attend your services, how many people are liking your posts. And so here's the problem. You're, you're, you're asking God to give you creative ways. Here's what you're saying. I want to help your heart. You're saying, Lord, give me creative ways to, uh, to reach the people. People. Here's the thing. That sounds great, but here's the real motivation. Your real motivation is I don't like being rejected. How can I put something together to get people to like me more? Here's the problem, my brother, my sister. If we really deal with the truth, you haven't, you're not really seeking God to find out his desire for you. He has the one who called you, he has given you the assignment. You must spend time in his presence to find out what is it he wants you to do. Watch this. And, and as you put out what he told you to put out, as you say what he wants you to say, nobody may tell you did good. But that's the peace of God on the inside of you to know, you know what, you did what I wanted you to do. That is what separates us from everybody else. We're not called to be light. I've never read a verse that says, do this so that people can like you. You know what also is a trap, and I've been, been interceding on this. You can have a thousand people told you you did good. And the God that gave you the assignment say, you know what, I can't trust you. Let me use somebody else. So you cannot use this as a measuring stick to say, say whether or not you in God's perfect will. Let's continue. It says that his brothers could not even speak peaceably unto him. They had so much hate in their heart. The Bible says out the abundance of the heart, the mouth speak. They couldn't find themselves to say anything nice. Why? They hated him so much. And you got to get this resolve on the inside of you. You can't control other people. You're going to have people that like you. You're going to have people that don't. They're just going to come with life. And a matter of fact, Scripture says, be weary when all men speak good of you. If everybody's telling you how great you are, there's a strong possibility. I want to say you're compromising. There's a strong possibility you're pleasing the people and not the one who gave you the, the assignment or the job. If you're called by God and you're anointed and you're not ruffling nobody's feathers, you're not making anybody uncomfortable, the things that you say God told you to say to the people is, I'm just being encouraging. I don't want to beat you up with the Bible. You know that the Bible is going to beat you up when the things about yourself don't match the Bible. So you're going to, what, what many are called being beat up is called conviction. It's the Holy Spirit helping you to see that you're not where you need to be according to his standards. We all see it. If you haven't read anything in this book and it makes you want to close the book and get upset, then I have the question, well, what are you doing? I do it all the time. When I read something and it points to the fact that God is holding me to a level of accountability. Watch this, that I'm not there yet and I need to make some changes. And I want to walk away. I want to slam it down. I don't want to look at this thing. I, want, I don't want to talk about this. I don't want to study it. Why? Because the moment I do that, guess what? It's removing my excuses. That's what this book is for. This book is not to tell you how to be a millionaire and everything in your life is going to be great. And I, and I, and I think, and I really believe and it's not just me thinking, I really believe this, that the prosperity gospel has made the church weak. We have thought that God is an ATM machine. We need to go to him. We're going to praise. We're going to worship. We're going to attend service so that God just give me a whole bunch of stuff. We reduce God to stuff. Watch this. I remember, I remember coming up in a time where people tear it 
to seek to fear the presence of the Lord. They got before God to fear his glory. They got before God for God to speak to them. What has happened to that? That has been replaced by I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prove that God is with me by the amount of stuff that I possess. That's, that's contrary to scripture. The Bible says a man's life does not consist in abundance of the things in which he possesses. So we have caused people to chase stuff and not chase after God. Lord forbid he try to develop you. You don't want that. He got to bless you today. He got to bless you tomorrow. And what we deem blessings. I see people post, and that's wonderful if you do it. God bless me, I got another thing. God bless me, I got, a, I got more increase. We, we really don't talk about, I really don't see people saying, you know what, I had an attitude problem. I don't have it anymore. Lord, I thank you. I don't see people say, Lord, I thank Jesus. Watch this, that I had a jealousy issue. If God increased somebody around me, but it hadn't yet hit me, it would be hard for me to truly celebrate with them. To me, that's the blessing. Why? Because he's changing you. He's conforming you to the image of his dear son. At one point in your life, you didn't see anything wrong with that behavior, but now you do. How did, you, how did that happen? The conviction of the Holy Spirit. That shows that God is in your life. Watch this. Let's look, at, let's look at this example as I move to verse 6. It says, and he said unto them, watch this, here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. Look at this. Joseph runs to his brothers who hate him. Sometimes you can be so naive that you can't even pick up on who don't like you. Joseph is 17 years old. He got 10 brothers in front of him who is older. He said, hey, God, let me tell you about this dream I had. Look, imagine this excitement that he has. Let's read verse 7. It says, for behold, we were binding shears in the field, and lo, my sheep shelf rose and also stood upright. In other words, they were all laid down. Mine stood up. And behold, your sheaves stood around about and made obese unto me. Watch this, to my sheep. Sheep, in other words, it started bowing down. Watch this. And his brethren said unto him, Shall thou indeed reign over us? And shall, and shall thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dream and for his words. This, this points to the immaturity on Joseph's part. Watch this. He's innocent. He, 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 really, he really mean well. Guys, let me tell you about this dream I had. I had a dream that we was tying up these, these uh, uh, wheat. Because if you study this, when they tie another wheat, it's not standing up right. It's laid down as they tie it. And after they finish, then they may raise it up. So he says, as we are doing this, guess what? Mine stood up while yours laid down. And it kind of, it looked like as though you were bowing down to me. So who you think you are? Who you think you are? See, here's the thing. Some of you will never reach your full uh, level of maturity because the moment you have a dream, the next morning we find out about it. How do we all we gotta do is follow your post? Let me tell you what the Lord showed me. Let me tell let me help you understand something. I, I know I'm gonna be offensive right now. When God reveals things to you, He's actually first speaking to you in the form of a secret. Secret means can I share something with you and not everybody else? I was having a conversation with someone yesterday and they mentioned this in this scripture that we only see in part. In other words, God doesn't show us the whole picture all at one time. And be weary of people who act as though they see the whole picture. He doesn't show us the whole picture. He shows us in, 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 in spurts. Immaturity says, I got to share with you the moment that I hear it. Have you ever told a person a secret and, and you only told them just for them and you find out later that they ran off and told someone else? What did you do? You say, you know what? I can't tell you stuff. Many times that's what God is saying to somebody that's watching me right now. The moment you hear anything, you go crazy and you start sharing. Can I also tell you something? That when God speaks to you in a dream, many times uh, th that it is, it's a great thing. Don't take what I'm saying. Uh, uh, hear me in perfect context. He speaks to us in dreams, and a lot of times God does speak to us in dreams. Here's the thing that you got to look at if God always speaks to you in dreams. If he's always speaking to you in, in dreams, it points to the fact that you're not still enough for him to speak to you while you're woke. So in other words, he had to catch you when everything is settled to now speak to you. The problem I got with that, if that's the only way that God speak to you is this. What are you doing when you're awake? Are you so busy running around trying to get the applause of everybody else that you haven't developed that quiet time that God can speak to you one on one? Joseph is immature. Obviously, I think this is the first time he sees something like this and he's excited and he wants them to, to see what God has shown him. Watch this. Not only. Is that, was that done? Verse 9 points to this. It says, and he dreamed yet another dream. And he told it to his brethren again. Behold, I have a dream, a dr and I, a dream more. 
And behold, the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars <laughs> again bowed down to him. <laughs> Watch this. Verse 10 says, he told it to his father and his brother, and to his brother. Watch it. His father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brother indeed come to bow down ourselves to, to thee, to the earth? His brother, brother envied him, but his father observed the same. His father observed the same. His brother got mad again. We just read the first dream. They hated him more. So imagine how they feel in the second time. But this time his dad hears of it. His, watch this. Everybody around Joseph is actually interpreting dreams, which points to the fact that they are also dreamers. And everybody seems to have a gift of uh, interpretation. We see Jacob definitely has it because now he dreams about a moon and, and stars. And, and Jacob is the one who says, I must be the sun. Your mother must be the moon. Your brothers are the stars. Are you saying that we're all going to bow down to you? And notice what, I, what it says first. It says that he was first what? Rebuked. He wasn't rebuked by his brothers. He was hated by them. But he was rebuked by his father. Let's, here's the next point that I want to bring out. In the midst of getting where you're supposed to get to, no one arrives there by themselves. There's a, there's a deception, spirit of deception, and a spirit of rebellion that's coming upon the church that now everybody's called to the fivefold ministry, and that's not true. Everybody, not only is everybody called to the fivefold ministry, if you do not, watch this, what we have called recognize someone's call, then you're hating on them. So if my call is not recognized, let me go somewhere where it is, and if I go to so several places and it's not, I'll just go out on my own. There's somebody who's watching me now. You're, you're an island in the kingdom. You know, you, you, had, you said the Lord told you to go and do this. You don't associate yourself with a particular church because pastors are this and bishops are this and apostles are this. Um, you're walking in the spirit of rebellion because you cannot show me in Scripture where God does not give you some kind of spiritual accountability. When you're, a spiritual accountability is not people that's on your level telling you how great you are. That's not spiritual accountability. If you are a uh, nomad and you're running around in the wilderness and you got other people running around in the wilderness who all have not been to the promised land, they could look at anything and tell you you're great. Here's the problem. The problem is that now when you walk into the thing that God has ordained for you, you can never see it. Why? Because you're talking to people who've never been to the place that you claim that you want to go. And so we're damaging people along the way because watch this. Many times, the first time you may go to the person who has spiritual authority over you, they may rebuke you first before they tell you, great job. Our pride won't let that happen. Now, let's deal with the root of the issue. The root of the issue is, I think, the lack of fathering inside the home. Uh, from a pastor perspective and being a spiritual father to people, one of the things that I find very challenging is when you're trying to father someone who don't know how to be father. They may be great at being mother, but they don't know how to be father. And so their frame of reference is a great mother. And a great mother does what? She's anointed to be the help me. So a help me, here's the difference between a father and a mother. If you go out and you run, the fact that you tried to run and you came in last, your mom is cheering you all the way around the, the, the uh, track. And when you come in last, even though you stopped two times along the way, your mom says, that's my baby. And then when you come in last, mom yells and say, there you go, good job, where a dad may not say anything. But because you didn't have dad there, that when you, after you get through running and dad says, but now you see why I told you you need to practice more. Now you see why I told you you need to lift more weights. Now you see why I told you that if you don't put in the work privately, here's what's going to happen publicly. It's not that he doesn't care. It's not that he don't want to see you win. He understands but privately, you're not doing what you need to do. But publicly, you want praise. 
Mom is there to give you praise or support regardless. Not to say father can't do it, but his support looks different. His love looks different. As I mentioned before, it's hard to father someone who don't understand what it's like to be fathered. And so I believe that is, it is something that starts first in the home. If the father's not there, then now when you are put in a situation whereby someone is called to develop you differently than how mom has, you automatically see that as rejection. You see it as an attack against you. But notice what verse 11 says, while the brothers envied him, his father observed the saying. So here's the thing. His father rebuked him first. First thing that he had to deal with was his pride. Why are you telling us? Why do you feel the need to share something that you receive privately? And here's the thing that you got to understand as well. His father has not left him. He's still there to develop him, and he want to see him win. We see that his intent was never to break him down. It wasn't to destroy him. The, the hard part is, is that when you are sharing with someone, I'm talking about development, and, and, and I believe that someone listening now, and they're struggling with, well, what do I need to do different? The thing that you got to recognize is that as you're developing people, their idea of development, it comes from their frame of reference. And so what makes people comfortable is that you do deal with them the way that they used to being dealt with. The moment you shift that is going to bring some kind of conflict. Now, the conflict may just be internal and they get that resolved and they continue development of process or it may show up externally. And so they share a dream and they say, well, this is what God gave me. And if the first thing you say, well, OK, I hear that God gave it to you, but I don't think that that's going to happen tomorrow. I believe that there are some things that we need to look at that you get resolved so it don't hinder what it is that you say God gave you to do. Lord forbid, <laughs> as we're looking at this dream, and this is something I want to deal, deal with, and I feel that some, someone's heart is wrestling with this. There's a difference between God giving you something in your dream and you using your imagination. And want God to confirm that. And what I mean by that is God is, is not in the business of confirming <laughs> our imagination. He's only going to confirm his word. But Pastor Shell, how do I know the difference? I'm glad that you asked because dreams can be real tricky. I dream about a whole bunch of stuff. I dream almost every night. Matter of fact, there are times I, I just despise dreaming. I don't like to dream. I, just the other night, I, before I went to sleep, I, I said, ah, babe, I don't want to dream tonight. Just give me a peaceful sleep. And, and she began to pray over me. And, you know, I don't know if she was serious or playing. She said, Lord, give them a good sleep, night's sleep, this, this, and this. But my point is my spirit is very sensitive. If, I, if I'm asleep and the TV is on, it pops into my dream. So just because I'm dreaming about something that was on the TV screen doesn't mean that God was revealing something to me. Let me clarify that. I also am a visionary by nature. I can see something and just start taking it somewhere. I can use my imagination to be tremendously creative and innovative. Doesn't mean God's telling me that. But through trial and error, I, learn, I, I continue to learn the difference between the two. Because Just because I, I get excited about something that I am envisioning doesn't mean it's coming from God. How do we balance it? Here's how you must balance it. Must balance it, here's the thing. If you come to me and you tell me that God gave you something, but you cannot prove it into the word, with the word of God, I'm going to question that God really speak to you. Number two, how is your prayer life? This is how you got to balance them. You got to spend time in the presence of the Lord that he conforms you into the image of his son by flushing out everything in you that's not right. That must also be balanced with your study time, because here's the thing that you got to understand. God is not obligated by meeting our imaginations or confirming our emotions. He's going to only do what his word says. I don't care who you are. I don't care what title you possess. I don't care what you told people. God is not in the business of backing up our imaginations. He's in the business, watch this, of only confirming what he has already set out to do. See, the thing that you got to understand that God has already set this thing, now he's rewinding it again. He's only going to do what he's set to do. The key is not to get God to bend toward you, what you and I want. It is for us to bend to what God wants. It is it's, it's, it's what Jesus said in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but thine will. Here's how the, the scary part, when I hear people talk, and it's amazing, they think that prayer is something used to bend God to do what we think he should do. That's what we, we think that, God, I'm going to pray this. Watch this. And this naming and claiming stuff that's out. Dedicate your day and claim your day. 
the most of the stuff I hear is people claiming what they want to happen, not what does the word say. Your day should be centered around the God who gave you the day. The God who woke you up that morning, the God that gave you breath, the God that put you in the right mind, the God that gave you the activities, activities of your limb. Not you just set out to do whatever your heart desire and oh yeah, by the way, God, I need you to bless me in this endeavor to prove to me that you're on my side. It doesn't work that way. It, if, if God was to do it that way, he is submitting to us, not we submitting to him. And submission only comes when you're asked to do something you don't want to do. That means God must now change me. If God has a plan for my life, and if I was already there, guess what? It would be happening. So that means he has to do something to me. He has to prepare me. Look at this same Joseph that we're reading about that's 17 years old. By the time he is running Egypt, he's no longer 17. He's been through some stuff. Watch this. He's going to mature. He's matured to such a degree, and I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, that at first he, black, he blurts out what he thinks is going to happen. We're going to see that he's going to talk to his brothers later on in his life. He doesn't rush to tell them who he is. He doesn't rush to tell stuff. Same Joseph, same brothers. Joseph have matured. Somebody that's listening to me right now, here's the thing. The reason you can't be successful, you sabotage what God wants to do in your life in the first 24 hours. You can't wait to go and share it. You can't wait to tell somebody. And the same people you are telling may be the same ones that don't want to see you prosper. Watch this. It says that they hated him, but you got to be careful when you tell stuff to people that hate themselves first. If somebody hates themselves, they'll never be happy for you because your success points to the fact of them have yet have arrived to the thing that they want to see happen in their lives. How can they be happy for you and they're not even happy with their own selves? If they are self-destructing in their own behavior, what make you think they're going to help you achieve your goal? Get over that. Stop running to people that will never be happy for you. Here's the truth of the matter. They're not happy with their own life. So why do you think they'll be happy with yours? But you have to get, go through that so you can mature. I'm not even saying that they need to stop doing what they're doing. You need to mature. As we continue looking at this story, we don't even focus on the fact of what other brothers are doing or, doing or not doing. You know who we focus on? What's going on with Joseph? Has he changed? Has he matured? Has he learned from some stuff? We see that in verse 11 that his brothers envied him. But his father observed the saying. When you have been chosen to be the first fruit offering, God's going to put you around somebody, watch this, who is an offering now and who have been an offering before. So they recognize the stages that you're in. Don't confuse someone developing you as someone hating on you. The moment we are in a, in a society that is so sensitive, the moment you don't tell people what they want to hear, you're hating. The moment that you tell them to slow down, you just don't want to see them fulfill it. The moment you, you dare not tell them that they are wrong, that what they think that God told them does not find its support in Scripture, that means God is not going to back it. Oh, you got something against me. You just don't want to see me prosper. <laughs> but you got to stand strong. You got to stand strong. You got to understand that what is it that God is doing. I remember, I want to share this with you. I, I remember one of the greatest lessons I've learned. I ministered a message, and part of my grace is breaking the spirit of perversion. I didn't know it at the time. And I shared a message, and all of my messages is centered around us yielding to God more. How much more of our heart can we give? Is he really the center of everything that we do? And so I, I began to share, and I remember one particular time I had uh, went to the store. I, I used to eat Snicker bars a lot, and I got the wrapper. I got in the car, took the bar out of the wrapper, and threw that wrapper outside of the truck. Holy Spirit convicted my heart. He said, I called you to clean up, not mess up get out and get the paper. I got out, got the paper. I ended up sharing. I, I didn't have my own church at the time. I was an uh, a assistant pastor, associate pastor at a church. Um, and I shared the story. One of the other uh, leaders uh, came to me afterwards and said, well, you know, I don't think it takes all that. And I respected that. And so just so happens I got a chance to minister again. Everything that God gave me, I didn't share. But instead, I'm in, I'm, you know, 
our personality type. I can encourage. I can, you know, do all that. So I began to just, hey, God's going to bless you. Here's what gonna, he's going to do this in not many days. And I did all the gyrations and did all the, the, the cliches. Church standing up. Everybody running around. Uh, they playing on the uh, organ or piano, whatever they had at the time. And someone would gauge that a great service. The same leader that I'm referring to came to me afterwards and said, that's more like it. I got in the car, as, 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 but let me rewind, as I'm leaving, people are telling me how much they enjoy service, but I'm, I'm feeling this emptiness on the inside of me. I get in the car, take my key, I put in the ignition. The Holy Spirit speaks to me. He says, if you can't say what I want you to say, you won't say nothing at all. Before I pulled out of the parking lot of the church, he spoke to me and told me that. I could say for the next three, four, five, six months of my life, can't quite remember exactly how long, Holy Spirit st stopped speaking to me. He was speaking to me on a regular basis. I was trying to build, being consistent in prayer, studying the word of God and all these different things. I was actually working a security job that I had time at night uh, to study the word. I'm reading, nothing coming to me. I'm praying, don't feel his presence. God stopped speaking to me. And I learned then, it is very much possible to get the approval rating of people and this be disapproved by God. I learned in that lesson, what's the most important voice I need to hear? It needs to be his. I repented. Asked God to forgive me, told him I learned my lesson. Still, he didn't say anything for a while. God started speaking back to me. I was asked to minister again. My whole motivation was different. I didn't care who stood up. I didn't care how many amens I got. I didn't care how many people ran around. I shared what he had been dealing with me on. And I told him, I said, I hope this bless you if it doesn't. It's, it blessed me. <laughs> Over 20-some years later, that's still my motivation. I want to fulfill everything that God has ordained for my life. I recognize that I'm a first fruit offering. And I'm talking to those of you who are a first fruit offering as well. But the thing that you got to understand, you're not going to get there without being developed. There's somebody out there who knows more than you. There's somebody out there who can get you to where you need to be a lot quicker than you trying to get yourself there by yourself. But the thing is, you don't know what it's like to be father. You don't know what it's like to be developed. Anytime you're inconvenienced, you assume you're being hated on. But the truth of the matter, you're not being hated on. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I, someone just questioned this. But Pastor Hill, what if you tried to put yourself in position to be developed? And the person who tried to develop you didn't do right by you. They caused you church hurt. They caused you church pain. Your leader was not faithful. Your leader didn't do this. Your leader didn't do that. Here's the thing. God still can fulfill his will in your life. Let's use David as a backdrop. Saul wasn't the best leader. Saul didn't intentionally try to develop David, but David was still being developed as a king under the hand of bad leadership. Just because you have one bad experience doesn't give you the right to cancel everything. Matter of fact, isn't it amazing? Uh, I'm pretty sure you had, you've had one, more than one boyfriend in life, more than one girlfriend. Some of you, more than one husband, more than one wife. And you're praying for God to do what? Send somebody else in your life. Isn't it amazing that while you're dating, you take one experience and use that as a learning experience to make you better? But when we get into ministry, I've been disappointed, so I'm not doing it anymore. <laughs> and what it shows is the moment you can do something that gratifies your flesh, you all in. But when you have to do something that gets you to fulfill your God-given assignment, you make excuses. You're going to always be disappointed, ladies and gentlemen, as long as you deal with people. People are going to disappoint you, and you're going to disappoint them. That's called life. There are times as a leader... You do the best you know how to do at the time, and you find out five years later that wasn't the best thing to do, but it was your best at that moment. As I prayed over this text, I want to deal with for a second as we get ready to finish. That person who has been called to be that first fruit offering. 
And one of the things I want to help you to understand, if you look over your life, you should be able to see that God has been developing you your whole life. And here's what I tend to, to say, and I use this as an example. We teach a class dealing with sexual abuse called Tamar. Um, and in the class, what we bring out and what we end up dealing with is the fact that people normally uh, go through their abuse. A lot of times, not say it can't happen, a lot of times most uh, uh, those who have been abused can trace their abuse starting in their childhood. And I like to talk about Matthew 13 that, that says why men slept, the enemy came and sold tears among the weak. So what the enemy normally do, and I see this as a track record, he doesn't start sowing negative seeds in your life in your adulthood. So the, the bad issue that you went through at the church in your 20s, I want to say that the enemy has already been sowing negative seeds. If you really want to trace back, and I'm not saying you didn't have a bad experience. I don't want to say that the pastor lied or, or you had a bad experience with the evangelist and, you know, that the prophet prophet lied to you. I'm not saying those things didn't happen. But what I want to help you to understand is that may have been your last straw. If we were to really dive into it, I guarantee you, if we, you check back in your childhood, your childhood disappointed you. There was some negative seeds sown there. Maybe your father wasn't who you thought he should be. Maybe your mother wasn't who you thought they should be. Maybe your siblings wasn't who you thought they should be. And so all this stuff builds up to the point that now when you get become an adult, now I'm hurt in church and this is the last straw. I'm not going back. And what we talk about in Tamar is the fact that many people who've been abused, they actually can trace it back to their childhood. Here's the issue. Many people are using their adulthood to try to undo what happened to them in their childhood. If you look back at it, it's amazing how you remember how we want to be older so quick that when we talk to little kids that they're six, they already talk about, but when I turn seven and when they're nine, they talk about, but when I get 12 and when they're 12, they can't wait to be 15 and 16, 16 can't wait to be 18. Isn't it amazing that they used to tell us stay a child while you can because you got the rest of your life to be an adult. That's so true. But we, did, we couldn't wait for things to progress. But here's what tends to happen. We get negative seeds sown us in our childhood. You spend your whole adulthood trying to undo what happened to you in your childhood. So in your childhood, someone fondles you, someone touches you. And now it irks you for somebody to touch you in your adulthood. But now you're married. Now it's your husband. Now it's your wife. Now you have children. You take this thing that happened to you when you were eight. Now you want to talk about it at 28, and you blame yourself for what happened to you at 8 years old, saying, I should have known better. But how could you have known better? You was 8 years old, and the person that was over you was 18, and now they tell you to go in the room. They are there to watch over you, and now when you get into the room, something happens to you that affects you for the rest of your life. But at 28, yeah, you know you should not have went in the room. Yeah, you can tell their posture. Yeah, you can tell their tone. Yeah, you notice that there was nobody in the house. But there's somebody that's, that's listening to me now, and there's some things that enemy has sown in your childhood, and you're spending your adulthood trying to undo. You're beating yourself up. You're not walking in the thing that God has ordained. But God has called you to be the first fruit offering. Not saying that you had to go through that to become who God wants you to be. What I'm trying to help you to understand is that all things work together for the good to them that love God, to those that are called according to his purpose. Here's the thing. You didn't die from it. So can God use it? Or will you continue to punish everybody because of something that happened to you when you was eight years old? Okay, your father was on drugs. He was never there. Your mother chose men over you. She left you alone. And the person that should have been watching over you victimized you. So now are you going to penalize everybody that comes in your life because of what happened to you back then? Some of you, that's what you're doing. You may before now not admit it, but that's what you're doing. And you're hindering from becoming who God has ordained for you to be. Guess what? God used people to help us to get there. He used bad situations and he used good ones. But I believe that as he has called you to another level, here's what's going to happen. He's going to put you around someone who sees something in you. And the moment they see it in you, may not come to you and tell you how great you are and call you out in a crowd of people, tell you come to the front of the church, tell you to lift your hands and lay hands on you and say, I stir this up in you because God said you're going to be a prophet to the nations. It may not start out that way. It may start out by you coming in with your anointing and call self and they tell you, well, we need someone to clean the bathroom. They may tell you they need someone to stand at the door to greet people. They may tell you they need you to 
work in the audio department just to make sure that the sound is great for someone else to use their gift. See, the problem is everybody wants the end result right now. We live in a society that everybody wants instant gratification. Some people actually believe that once you give me the microphone, I have arrived. Mm, that's not it at all. We don't want to do the behind the scenes thing. We don't want to do the things that's not going to bring us instant gratification and the applause of men. We want the thing that's going to get me to shine. We want, we can't, we're not satisfied with being in the choir. We need to have our, be the one to do the solo. The solo is not enough. I want to be on the praise team. We can't stand in the background anymore. We're living in a society that everybody wants the front and center, but everybody's not called to the front and center. Even as I'm sharing with you right now, there's more people here working behind the scenes to make sure that you have a product than me that's standing in front of the camera. And all of us have our own function. I'm called to do what I'm called to do. They're called to do what they're called to do. God took them through what he took them through in life just to give them a passion and an eye to do the things that they're doing. Just as he has done it with me. So it doesn't mean that I'm better than them. It doesn't mean that they're better than me. Guess what? I'm gifted in a way that they're not. They're gifted in a way that I'm not. But when we work it all together, guess what? We can produce a product and come before you now, even in the midst of this uh, pandemic, and give you the word of God. We're all working together. My heart desires that the church, the ecclesia, the called out ones, everybody will fit in their function and they will work together. All of us are called. All of us. We're just called to do different things. And can we get to the place that it's not about us being seen, but it's about God being seen? That's what my heart desire is. I want to pray for that person that's listening to me right now. This message is pondering your heart. It's caused you to rethink things. It's called, it brought confirmation to maybe some stuff that you went through in your childhood. And you recognize how the enemy is still robbing you now in your adulthood. I want to pray that God will offset that, that. That demonic influence that's keeping you from being what God has ordained is broken off your life. I believe it's known as the spirit of perversion. Perversion means to deviate from God's original intent. God wants to do some tremendous things in your life. He wants to use you in an awesome way. But you got to align yourself to his will. You got to deal with that rejection, you being rejected of men. And that's causing you to have self-rejection. You've been, even though you're in ministry, you're using ministry as a tool to make you feel better about yourself. Your motivation to please God has left. Now you're after the crowd. You're after how many likes can you get? How many people are telling you that you're doing right at the expense of fulfilling God's assignment for your life? Maybe God didn't call you to have a big church. It's okay. Maybe you are not supposed to have 20,000 members. It's all right. Did you know that 90% of the churches have less than 100 people. So the moment you exceed 100, you are already outside the norm. But that's not enough for you, right? Because you know somebody who has 300. You know somebody has 800. You know somebody has 1,000. Guess what? More people, more problems. Don't let that be your defining moment. Don't let that be the thing that validates you. Let your validation be his grace and his glory. What about that time that you spent before God, before all of this ever happened, that you were just so happy to be a, a, just a number, that no matter what God asked you to do, you would do it without hesitation? When can we get back to that place? When can we get back to the fact that it wasn't about a title? It was not about an ordination. Because the truth of the matter, your first ordination should have happened when God called you out your mother's womb. You don't believe me? Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 1. He told him that he ordained them. It's before he even got to earth. So I'm not saying that's not important. My point is, my heart desires that you chase after God again. That person that's listening to this, the thing that you told everybody God told you, show it to them in the word. And if you can't, you're using your imagination. Because it's really, when it's really a God thing, here's the truth of the matter, which I really believe. When it's really a God thing, you stop being excited. When it's really a God thing, he shows you the responsibility. When it's really a God thing, it will bring tears to your eyes because you wonder, do I have enough to even do what you're asking me to do? When it's a God thing, you get rebuked before you get praised. When it's a God thing. When it's a God thing, 
it pushes you to your face. It, it causes your lifestyle to change, your attitude to change, the people around you to change. Not because you think you're better than them, but something on the inside of you is pulling you away from the club. It's pu pu pulling you away from the weed. It's pu pulling you away from the illicit sex. It's pulling you away from shacking up with somebody that you're not married to. It pulls you away from foolishness when you're really called. I'm speaking to that person right now. I believe the Holy Spirit is, is ministering to your heart. And you're saying, Pastor Shell, I really need to hear this. I didn't want to hear it, but I need to hear it. That's what's going on right now. I'm, I'm not being satisfied. It's not everybody else. It's me. I'm called to be a first fruit offering. As I'm praying for you right now, I pray that right where you are, that you would give your heart back to God. I know it's not popular. I don't see too many people asking you to do that. But I'm going to ask you to do it. That's what I'm called to do. I'm called to pull you back into his presence. I'm called to pull you back into his word. And I'm called to pull you back into the lifestyle that's pleasing to him. May God enrich you, empower you. May he consume you right now. May he not leave you alone. If there's anything in your life that is contrary to what he has purposed you, may it, may it increase, may the fire increase, may the conviction increase. May you change. May you yield. And may you be the first fruit offering that God has ordained for you to be. May it be about him and no more about you. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity. Thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name.